Hey guys and gals, Effie here. Today I want to talk to you about The Bloody Chamber by Angela Carter. It is a collection of folklore and fairy tales sort of retold with a feminist bent. And don't get me wrong, this is not a politically charged book, right? So when I say it has a feminist bent, what I mean is that the female characters in the stories, the way that they're retold, it allows them agency. It allows them to make decisions on their own, and then for the consequences of those those decisions that they make to actually impact their lives. So there's no fairy godmothers swooping in to like magic all the pr problems away, and there's no like handsome prince riding in on a big white horse to save them. They make the decisions, they have to save themselves, and I really appreciated that that was kind of a different slant on old fables and folklores and fairy tales that we're all familiar with. Throughout the book, all of the stories have this sort of like dark sensuality, right? There's a, there's a lot of blood, so if you're not into that, you know, definitely this is not for you. Um, but if you're into that sort of like dark, gothic, like I said, very sensual, very aware of its sexuality, um, I, I thought that it was very rich. It was a very rich reading experience, so I really appreciated that. Uh, the way that the author uses language specifically, is very sort of indulgent. Uh, she uses all of your senses, so she doesn't just describe how things sound or how things look. Uh, she also describes the texture of them when you feel them, the way that fur, for example, feels in your fingers. She describes scents in such a way that, you know, uh, it's very evocative of memories that you have. So uh, the scent of a cigar, for example, or the scent of incense, a really heady, overwhelming incense, or being trapped in a small bedroom with hundreds of lilies and that sort of overwhelming, claustrophobic sort of sick sweet smell that, that is both sweet and pleasant and also too much and nauseating. And she sort of uses that and then harkens it back to, for example, a funeral where you feel sort of oppressed and you feel sort of closed in and the weight of the death is sort of mingled in with your memories of this scent. And then she uses that and manipulates that memory to draw you into the story. And I loved the way that she used language to do that. Of all of the stories, Puss in Boots was by far my favorite. And I don't know how to explain it other than it's told from the perspective of Puss. It's told from the perspective of the cat and it is so cat. It is the way that you would expect a cat to narrate his life. It's the way that you would expect a cat to um, think about things and process information. And she just did such a good job of telling a story from the cat's perspective. So that one was my favorite, and it's probably something I'll read again. There were a few of the stories that I didn't like as well. Uh, the Courtship of Mr. Lion, for example, had several time jumps that were not well marked. Uh, I don't need you to hold my hand and be like two weeks later, but I do need some sort of signal that like, oh, hey, we're like jumping three months into the future. And she doesn't really do that in the story. So you wind up jumping ahead in time, not realizing it's happened. And then three or four paragraphs later, you're like, oh, she's not even in the same place anymore. Like we're not even in the same village. And uh, you have to kind of go back and reread those paragraphs with new perspective. And I don't really like it when that happens. So I would rather the time jumps have been called out a little more clearly, but maybe it's a step stylistic preference and I'm just not familiar with it. There were also a few really short stories that felt rushed or incomplete. So specifically The Werewolf and The Snow Child. So The Snow Child is a retelling of uh, Snow White and The Werewolf is a retelling of Little Red Riding Hood. And both of them sort of felt like they were um, sort of notes jotted down or something that the author thought of and wrote them down really quick so that she didn't forget to, you know, include it, but she didn't really flesh them out. Like she never really went back and developed them beyond just the original idea. And they didn't really feel like they sort of jived with the rest of the stories. All of the stories kind of had, a, like I said, that feminist bent where 
the the woman in the story has impact on the story. And those two in particular didn't really give me that feeling. Um, they were sort of things happening to the character rather than the character happening to the things. Um, and I, I didn't really like them. I thought that, you know, they're only a page and a half long. And like I said, they felt more like ideas that got jotted down and then for some reason included rather than actual fleshed out, fully thought through short stories. Um, and they didn't feel like they had a place in this book. Overall, I really enjoyed this little book. Her use of language is stunning, and the twist that she puts on some of the fairy tales I found to be really interesting and pleasurable. And like I said, it's worth reading just to read Puss in Boots. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button, and of course if you like the way that I present information, hit the subscribe button and the notification bell down below. You can find all of my social media contacts in the description. And of course, if you want to keep up with me and the progress I'm making on my current novel, you can do that at effiewritesbooks.com. Thank you so much for watching, have an excellent day, and I'll see you next time.